What is up, everybody? Welcome to DFS by the Numbers. This is my betting breakdown video for UFC 299. We got Sean O'Malley going against Marlon Vera. And yeah, I can't wait for this card. It's, it's stacked from top to bottom, especially this main card. Like on paper, this is one of the better cards in a very long time. So looking forward to it. Looking forward to talking through these fights from a betting perspective. I found some spots. I'm up late night recording this video for you guys. Um, so yeah, if you guys could do me a favor, leave a like on the video. Subscribe to the channel. It is much appreciated. Be on the look for Best Bet, the live stream on fight day, 4 o'clock Eastern time. Make sure you guys show up. And, uh, yeah, it should be a fun show on fight day there. And then it is a big, massive car, so I'm going to be bringing back my prop contest uh, to enter the contest. First, leave a like. Second, subscribe if you haven't already. And then third, comment down your biggest plus money prop. Uh, say, for example, maybe you're liking, I don't know, Curtis Blades by sub for some reason, plus 2,500. Comment it down. Whoever gets the biggest plus odds, uh, $25 to first. And on top of that, you, you probably hit your bet as well. So comment down those big plus money props. I have some big plus money props myself for this card looking to cash in for UFC 299. But with all that out of the way, guys, I say we get into it. And we're going to start with the first fight on the card. We have Marina Moreau's going against Joanne Wood. And yeah, there's some narrative things in this fight. Uh, Joanne Wood came out and said this is officially her retirement fight, which kind of interesting. I thought her retirement fight might have been in the, her last fight with Luana Carolina. I thought it would have been kind of smart to go out there and you know end on a, on a win against Carolina, but... She's uh she's saying this is her last fight. So Joanne Wood, I'm actually a big fan of Joanne Wood. I'm a big fan of her style. I think she's a really good striker, brings a lot of volume to the table, but she definitely has a, a pretty big hole in her game, and that is the, the grappling, right? Um, she hasn't looked the same. You know, she's 38 years old at this point. She hasn't looked that great in the last like three, four fights. Uh, I think this is a good matchup for Marina Moroz to go out there and 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 win win in pretty dominant fashion. But you know, if you're Marina Moroz, you gotta fight smart here. If Marina Moroz goes out there and strikes with Joanne Wood for 15 minutes, she's not looking minus 230. And honestly, Joanne Wood potentially wins the decision. But you know, where Moroz pays off this price tag is going out there getting the fight down to the mat. And once she does, I just think there's a huge edge in terms of the grappling in favor. Of Marina Moreau. So a prop that I do like, I don't want to go heavy on it because, you know, I have a feeling Rose might go out there and, and play on the feet for too long. But if she takes the path to least resistance, I think she finds that sub. And the sub is, is plus 375. I kind of feel like if Moroz is paying off this price tag, this minus 230 price tag, she's getting takedowns. And if she's getting takedowns, I think she's getting a sub. Wood's been sub five times. She's been sub like four times in the UFC alone. So give me Moroz to kick off the card and Moroz to win the fight by sub. Plus 375, it just seems too wide. Moving on, we got Asu Amubayev going against CG Vergara. And I think we kind of keep the sub train rolling here. Um, I like Asu Amubayev to win this fight by submission. The sub prop is, is not anywhere near the Moreau sub prop. It's plus 110. It's even like minus 105 on some books. But I kind of think the sub happens later in the fight. CG Vergara, I don't think he has, you know, the worst grappling defense in the world. He has been submitted twice. But, you know, I kind of feel like uh, Amabayev gets this fight done in the second or third round. I, I like the second or third round props. I think at the very least, Vergara is able to hang in there for a little bit. But at, just at some point in this fight, I think Asu is going to find something, right? Uh, CJ Vergara, he makes a ton of mistakes on the mat. He's giving up his back. He's giving up dominant positions. And I just feel like Amabayev should have no problem getting this fight down to the ground. And once he does, I think something will open up over 15 minutes. I think this fight does get it extended, though. Um, but yeah, I like Alma Baev, like I'm leaning like second round submission, but could come in the third as well. So I sprinkled a quarter unit on each uh, round two sub is plus 575 round three sub is plus 900. I think those are definitely very live. Uh, could happen in round one for sure. But you know, uh, uh Fergara was able to hang in there an uh, entire round with, uh, Tetsura Tayara. I think it can hang in there at least a round, round and a half against, uh, Asu here. So give me Asu, Asu to win this fight by sub. More specifically, hopefully, in uh, round two or round three. Moving on, we got Rebellus to Spain going against Josh Parisian. Yeah, nothing sticking out here. I mean, um, I might throw some, well, I probably am going to throw some to Spain, Parisian under one and a half and some D-Gen parlays. Maybe the fight won't start round two and some D-Gen parlays. If you want to get really degenerate, you, you you might even look at the Despain 60-second prop at plus 400. But, yeah, I mean, it should be Despain. should be Despain, probably round one knockout, but they're definitely all over it. I think I saw Despain round one knockout at, like, minus 200. You're just, 
you just don't want to be getting in a ha bad habit of laying that much juice on like a first round knockout prop. But that is the the obvious outcome. I don't like Josh Parisian's chances. You know, in theory, maybe Josh Parisian can get this fight down to the mat, extend the fight. But I have a feeling Parisian's going to go out there, strike with this guy, and at that point, get caught with something big in probably the first 60 seconds or so. So yeah, give me to Spain, to Spain first round knockout. The under one and a half, if you're looking for a good parlay piece, I think it's there. Next, we got Ion Kudalaba going against Philippe Linz. And yeah, I wasn't going to bet on this fight, but there are some spots sticking out. So I feel like this is fight is going to be an absolute car crash, right? Like all Kudalaba fights are. But the thing with Kudalaba is this guy just falls off a cliff after those first five minutes, you know? In those first five minutes, he's going out there, balls to the wall, having some success. But once the fight reaches the second round, he's done in a lot of these fights. So, you know, I feel like Kudalaba, if he wins, it's probably in round one. He, he dressed up as Hulk at the weigh-ins. I feel like we're getting, you know, vintage Ion Kudalaba in this fight, which is only going to lead to probably more violence here. But if he's not able to finish Philippe Lins, like... I have a feeling Philippe Lins is going to be very live in that second and that third round to, to win this fight. So I don't want to bet this fight, to be honest. I don't want to be too heavily exposed in this fight. But, um, you know, the Philippe Lins by sub is a spot that I had circled the last time they were supposed to fight. This time they were fighting. It's not the best price in the world. I think it's like plus 550 for that sub, something like that, plus 525. But those late sub props are just crazy numbers. Philippe Lins, a second round submission, plus 2200. And then Philippe Lins, sub three is plus 4000. If this fight reaches the second round, I think those are very live. Kudalaba, just like Joanne Wood, loves to get submitted. Has four submission losses. Philippe Lins is a black belt in BJJ. I feel like uh, Kudalaba is live to potentially get submitted in that second or third round. Uh, Lins, round two, three props in general, I think are solid. But I'm going very small here just because, again, this is a car crash type of mess type of fight. Um, 0 0.15 units, uh, Lin sub 2 plus 2200, 0.1 units, Lin sub 3 plus 4000, only a quarter unit invested on this fight, and honestly, that's probably too much, but give me Lin's, I think he's live for that late sub, late finish. Moving on, we got Michelle Pereira going against Mikel Olazechuk, and yeah, I'm liking, I'm liking some, uh, some late sub props, you know, on this, on this, on these prelims here, and this is another spot. Like I was on, well, I am on the Mikhail Olazechuk side. I'm picking Mikhail Olazechuk, but I heard an interview with this guy that was very, very concerning. And basically, he was talking about how for this, for this fight, he is doesn't have a head coach. He's his own head coach, and he's not. He doesn't have training partners. He's training with like his buddies, and. Like, I've never heard that before. Like, the, the closest scenario I could think of is, like, the, the Mike Perry, his girlfriend being in his corner. But, so, I don't know. That's just weird to me. Like, Mikhail Olazechuk doesn't have a team for this for this uh, fight. Like, that's crazy to me. And the big thing with Mikhail Olazechuk is this guy has a massive, significant hole in his game. And that's the grappling. This guy's been submitted multiple times in the UFC. Four submission losses. His grappling's no good. What I do like, though, is the striking, the pressure, the power the volume, the body work that he does, but the cardio has been iffy, right? So if Michelle Pereira comes out here and fights smart, which he never does, but Michelle Pereira is a black belt in BJJ. Michelle Pereira does have a third round submission against Salim Imadaya. If Michelle Pereira grapples, he's going to, to run through Mikhail Olazechuk. Do I think he does it? I don't know. I think he should. And if he does, I think those sub props are, are very live. So I did sprinkle the late uh, Michelle Pereira sub props. Uh, the sub two is is plus seventeen hundred. The sub three is plus twenty five hundred. Quarter unit on each. I think the subs very live for Michelle Pereira. The odds indicate that they have the the sub prop at plus four seventy five only. Um, so I like those round two, round three. I think you know we've seen Mikhail Olazecha go out there in the first round and then come second round just have nothing left. Like in the OSP fight, OSP took him down and subbed him shortly after. I could see something like that happening if Michelle Pereira grapples late. I think he makes it look pretty easy there. Um, I'm not touching Mikhail Olazechuk this week. I mean, that interview was enough to just completely scare me away. Like that's that's weird to me. But we'll see if that we'll see if him being his own coach well, works out for him in this fight. Next, we got Kyler Phillips going against Pedro Munoz. Um, yeah, I have a spot here that I like. So there's two spots I like actually, and I have a bet on one of them. So the first spot is uh, the plus three and a half point spread on Pedro Munoz. I think the majority, if not all, the finishing upside is on the Munoz side. And then on top of that, I could see a scenario where Kyler Phillips wins those first two rounds and drops the third like he normally does. That plus three and a half is minus 145. 
And then the spot that I like even more is, is probably that finish only for Pedro Munoz. This guy's next level tough, next level durable. Eight losses for Munoz. None of them come inside the distance. He's never been knocked out. He's never even been dropped in the UFC. He's a BJJ black belt. He's not getting subbed here. The Pedro Munoz finish only is plus 165. A line that just makes no sense to me. Um, you know, Munoz is a guy that's just cast iron. You know, nobody's probably ever going to finish this guy you know there's just some guys that don't get finished Pedro Munoz is one of them and I could see a situation where you know Kyler Phillips gets tired you know Kyler Phillips gets tired he shoots in on a sloppy takedown and gets his neck snatched up um he gasses out in that third round maybe Munoz catches him in the third round so yeah I could see situations where Munoz does find that finish so yeah plus three and a half point spread makes a lot of sense I think Phillips probably wins a decision maybe dropping that third round I'm thinking like a 29-28 but that Pedro Munoz finish only plus 165. I like it. I have 1.5 units on it. I think it probably pushes, but if there's a finish in this fight, I think it's more likely coming on the Munoz side. Moving on, we got Mateus Gamrot going against Rafael Dos Anjos. Yeah, nothing here. It's it's Gamrot for me. It's Gamrot by decision, but holy crap, you know, the decision props minus 170. I uh, don't really want to touch that. We kind of talked about it with Javid Basharat last week. The decision prop was like minus 170, and that didn't really work out well. Just a lot could go wrong laying minus 170, I think, on a decision prop. But that's that's the most likely scenario. That's probably what happens. But I just don't see any way to play this fight. I thought maybe parlaying up Gamrot earlier in the week, but at minus 415, it's getting a little bit out of hand. So passing on this one, but Gamrot by decisions, the pick, and it's probably what happens. Macy Barber, Caitlin Chukagan. Uh, another pass for me, it's it's a fight that I think goes the distance more often than not. It's a fight that I think is going to be very close and competitive. Honestly, it's probably a dog or pass. And yeah, it's it's one of those fights where it's it's going to decision. The judges are probably going to screw it up like they do most of these fights. Like they've screwed up so many barber decisions, got so many barber decisions wrong. And then Caitlin Chukagan, they they get, you know, Chukagan wrong all the time as well. Like you look through Chukagan's record, like there's multiple fights where I thought she clearly lost and the judges are still scoring it for her. So yeah, it's a mess of a fight. It's uh you know, I, I I'm picking Barber, but laying minus two oh five, I think a lot can go wrong with these crooked, corrupt judges in a fight that probably goes the distance. Moving on to the feature prelim. And it's a breath of fresh air. I mean, last week they were featuring like Jamie Pickett and Eric Anders for some reason on the on the on the feature prelim. This week they actually have a real featured prelim. It's Charlton Almeida, Curtis Blades. This fight's awesome. I see a lot of hot takes on strong takes on either side. And I kind of have a strong take here as well. I feel like whoever wins this fight, though, is going to look like a massive favorite. How I'm seeing it play out is I think Curtis Blades is going to want to use his defensive wrestling to keep this fight upright. He said that himself, and I agree with it. You know, I think on the feet, Curtis Blades has proven to be the better striker, you know, outside of getting knocked out by these massive, hard-hitting, you know, heavyweights. But um, on the flip side, Giles and Almeida, I think everybody's low on him after that Derek Lewis performance. But we got to remember, up until then, this guy was running through dudes. You know, this guy, Jarlton, has 20 wins. 19 of those wins come before round three. The one that didn't was Derek Lewis. I think that Derek Lewis fight was an outlier. Like, I think Jarlton gets back to his finishing ways, his winning ways here. And if he gets uh, Curtis Blades down, which I kind of think he does, I think the finish will definitely open, uh, you know, present itself, right? Like, Curtis Blades, offensively, we know how great his wrestling is, but defensively, it's just a question mark. Uh, Curtis Blades off his back is just a question mark, and I have a feeling that Jarlton's going to have a significant advantage in terms of the BJJ, and if he can get on top, I think a sub's very live. I think a TKO is very live. So yeah, I'm taking Jarlton. I'm taking Jarlton to win this fight by submission. I sprinkled Jarlton round one sub, uh, half a unit plus 800, and then Jarlton round two sub, quarter unit plus 140, you know, we just don't see Jalton sub props that wide. I think, you know, just because he couldn't sub Derek Lewis, you know, people are thinking he can't sub Blades. But, you know, Derek Lewis, that guy doesn't have a neck. I mean, uh, Derek Lewis is, is hard to sub, whereas I think he could potentially sub Blades here. So, yeah, sub one, sub two, they're, they're big plus the money numbers. And then I also have a half unit on Jalton to win in round one or round two, plus 220. Again, 19 out of his 20 wins come before the third round. And to go even further, 18 of his 20 wins come under one and a half rounds. So I think that Derek Lewis fight is an outlier, and I think he goes out there and proves that this week. Uh, next we got Piotr Jan going against Song Yedong. Great fight to kick off the prelims. It's one I'm going to sit back and watch. It's a close fight. Um, you know, if this was a five-round fight, I'd be more inclined to bet Jan, but he just starts too slow for my liking. From a live bet standpoint, I might look 
to lie bet you on. I have a feeling he might drop the first round, or at the very least, the first round is going to be very close. Maybe get Jan at plus money going into round two. That's kind of how I'm approaching it. Um, I think it could be a good spot for Jan to kind of bounce back, a good buy low spot here for Jan. But at the end of the day, I do think this fight's going to be close. I could see Jan losing the first round, coming back 2-3. Um, could see like a split decision here as well. So it's not something I want to get invested in, but the pick will be on. Next, we got Jack Della Maddalena going against Gilbert Burns in a fight that also feels like it should be a pick but it's not really lined that way. And yeah, there's paths to both sides. Like you can make a case for Gilbert Burns. We've seen Jack taken down, put in into some bad spots, but I'm personally more on the Jack side. This guy's 10 years younger. Um, you know, Burns is 37. He's coming off of a little bit of a layoff and injury. And I just think Jack's going to have a massive advantage here on the feed. I really do. I mean, the striking of Jack De La Madalena is incredible. The volume, the precision, the power, um, the way he mixes it up to the body as well. And Burns, yes, he could get this fight down the map potentially. He does have a very good grappling game. But I kind of think Jack can stuff some takedowns here. And I think Jack, you know, if he does get taken down, does he get put in some bad spots? Yes. But to his credit, he's always getting out of those bad spots. So I think Jack's either either able to, uh, A, you just stuff the takedowns, keep it on the feet, or B, if he gets taken down, get back up. And on the feet, I think he really hurts Burns here. Um, I was looking at the Jack De La Madalena knockout prop. It's plus 160. The inside of the distance is plus 150. Like, you might as well go with the inside of the distance. Is he going to sub Burns? Probably not. But, I mean, if it's that close, you always take the inside of the distance. And that's what I'm doing. Jack De La Madalena, inside the distance, plus 150, one unit. I think he knocks out um, Gilbert Burns in this fight. Could be any I didn't want to mess with the round. Could be any round one, two, or three. But I think the, the knockout for Jack De La Madalena is very, very live here. And if you like Burns, you got to love that sub. I think I saw Burns sub at like plus 380. Yeah, if you like Burns, that sub could be on the table. But I'm on the Jack side, and I think Jack knocks him out. Next, we got Kevin Holland going against Michael Page. I want nothing to do with this fight. This is a Kevin Holland fight, and I typically don't like betting Kevin Holland fights. I mean, if you bet Kevin Holland fights, and I have in the past, um, he's just a guy you bet on in his fights in general. Like, when you bet on this guy's fights, you're, you have a hole in your, your wall by the end of the night. You, you're, you smash your TV. It's just so frustrating watching this guy fight at time. I mean, the fight IQ is the worst I've, I've ever seen um, ever with Kevin Holland. Um, if you're betting Kevin Holland, don't expect him to grapple because he's probably not. He's probably going to give Michael Page the exact fight he wants. And at that point, I think it's probably close. I think it probably goes to decision. I don't want nothing to do with this fight. I'm going to sit back and watch. Should be fun. I think, you know, I heard Michael Venom Page in his interview talking about how this is going to be the first in-fight podcast. Like, they're going to be talking to each other the whole time. Should be fun to watch, but I don't think it's going to be fun having any money on it, to be honest. So, going to sit back and watch it. Next, we got Benoit St. Denis going against Dustin Poirier. And yeah, this is my biggest bet of the night. I'm on the under three and a half rounds, um, minus 215 for 3.25 units. Dustin Poirier has 12, um, I think he has 13 actually, 13 five round fights. And I want to say it's like 11 out of 13 have finished under the three and a half round mark. He's been to decision in those five round fights twice. Once was against Holloway, who has been was just incredibly durable and then also once was against Dan Hooker in an all-out war but yeah a lot of his fights do finish under four and a half rounds a lot of his fights um or three and a half rounds a lot of his fights do finish under uh two and a half rounds as well um the the crazy thing here is for me like I think this fight does go over one and a half rounds but I kind of think it ends between like the late second round or somewhere in the third round like I, I really struggle to see this fight going too long just wait with the way these guys fight um, Dustin Poirier has a lot of power. Um, Benoit Saint Denis has a lot of power. Benoit Saint Denis has a really good grappling game as well. So yeah, I like violence here. I don't want to pick a side. Um, I don't want to bet a side. I'm picking Benoit Saint Denis, but this price is like kind of kind of wild to me. Like, you know, minus 205 for Benoit Saint Denis. I'm picking him to win. I like the fact that he's younger. I think at this point he's more durable. I think he's getting Poirier at the right time here. But holy crap! Like seeing Poirier at plus 175 is kind of wild. Um, but yeah, I can't trust Poirier at this point either. You're 35 years old, which is not entirely old, but in fight years, this guy's just been through war after war after war, coming off a knockout loss. Like, that's going to add up, and now he's going against Benoit St. Denis, who's the god of war, right? So yeah, I think somebody's getting served here. Whether it's a Dustin Poirier knockout win, or whether it's a Benoit St. Denis could be knockout or sub win, I'm kind of leaning sub, but just give me the under three and a half rounds. I think somebody gets served here round two or round three personally. Then we got Sean O'Malley going against Marlon Vera. 
Yeah, uh, interesting main event here. Like, I'm picking Sean O'Malley, Sean O'Malley by decision, but, you know, the more the weeks went on, like, the the less confident I really am in it. Like, I have a really bad feeling about this fight for Sean O'Malley. I think he's the more skilled fighter, especially in terms of the striking by a mile. It's not even close on the, the, the accuracy um, defensively as well, the footwork, the speed, the volume. Um, of O'Malley, I mean, this guy's just such a better, much better striker than Vera, but Vera has those intangibles. Vera has that five-round cardio. Vera has that next-level toughness, that next-level durability. We've seen Sean O'Malley, you know, injured multiple times in multiple fights in the UFC, the Sukumtoth fight, the, the first Vera fight. Um, so, yeah, durability all in favor of Vera. Cardio all in favor of, in favor of Vera. The five-round experience all in favor of Vera, but O'Malley's the better fighter. It's a weird one for me. You know, this price tag, it's, it's too wide on O'Malley. I think he wins this fight, wins it by decision, but I don't feel great about that prediction whatsoever. What I do feel great about, it, though, is the, the finish only for Marlon Vera. This guy's next level tough, next level durable, never been finished, never been dropped, never, I don't think Evan even had a scratch on him yet in the UFC. Is Sean O'Malley going to be the first one to knock him out? I don't think so. And the odds for that to happen are just trash. It's like plus 225. Like, if you if you want somebody to if you want if you think he's gonna knock out Marlon Vera, you need a much better knockout prop than plus two twenty five because Marlon Vera has never even been hurt in the UFC as far as I'm concerned. So I'm on the finish only one point five units plus one forty six. I think if there's a finish, it's more likely than it's gonna be Vera. Um, I think that probably does push. I think it probably goes to decision. I'm, I think it's probably O'Malley by decision doing the better work in the the early rounds. I think the Vera late sprinkles could be in play. Could be in play for sure. I think split decision could be in play. I think a lot of things could be in play in this fight, but what I am on is that that finish only. I think at the very least, it does push, and if there's a finish in this fight, I kind of think it's fair, to be honest. So, yeah, give me give me that that finish only to, to close up the card. So, a uh, quick recap of the bets. Moreau's uh, submission, half a unit, plus 375. I'm a buy of sub two, sub three, quarter unit on each, plus 575, round two, plus 900, round three. Michelle Pereira, uh, sub two, sub three, quarter unit, uh, plus 1,700, sub two, quarter unit, plus 2,500, sub three. Uh, Lins, sub two, sub three as well. Uh, 0.15 units, sub two for Lins, plus 2,200, 0.1 units, uh, plus 4,000 for sub three. Pedro Munoz, uh, finish only, 1.5 units, plus 165. Got Jalton sub one, half a unit, plus 800. Jalton sub two, quarter unit, plus 1,400. Jalton wins in round one or round two, half a unit, plus 220. Uh, Madalena inside the distance, one unit plus 150. The under three and a half rounds in the Poirier Benoit Saint Denis fight, uh, minus 215, 3.25 units. And then uh, Marlon Vera finish only, plus 1.5 units for plus uh, 146. There you guys have it. If you guys can, do me a favor, like on your way out, subscribe to the channel, comment down your biggest plus money prop. Could be anything, could be, I don't know, Macy Barber by sub plus 1100 just comment something down uh 25 dollars to the winner if there's a tie the tiebreaker will go to the person that that commented first but be sure to comment down those big plus money props i'm always curious to see what you guys come up with um see if you guys can hit some this week so there you go best of luck guys be on the lookout for best bet for eastern and we'll talk to you guys soon enjoy the card it should be a fun one see you